welcome to the stage, John Scully and John Nasta. Hey, all right. Good morning, everybody. How are you? So, so I've just realized that I have the best seat in the house. Um, what an honor, John, to get to sit next to you and chat. And you, I've had many conversations with John. He's always used the same four words, and I want to dig a little bit into those four words because it relates to one single-minded proposition that I think defines what you've done. So you always ask me, tell me more. So what is it the tell me more dynamic that drives John Scully? Well, ever since I was a little child, as far back as I can remember, I've always had an insatiable curiosity. Uh, I've always uh, wondered, you know, isn't there a better way to, to uh, do things? Uh, when I was uh, 13, I was a ham radio operator, and uh, I used to take uh, everything apart, electronic, but I'd never put it back the way it was. I'd try to Interesting. improvise it to be something else. And I remember one of my uh, favorite professors at MIT Media uh, Lab was Marvin Minsky. And mm. Marvin used to say, you don't really understand something well unless you understand it more than one way. And that was such a stroke of wisdom to pass on to uh, me and many others, because you discover when you're trying to be out on the edge and you're curious about, so what comes next? Uh, that, and I'll give you an example, uh, when I was recruited to Apple in 1982, Steve Jobs was the only one in Silicon Valley who saw that Moore's Law, personal computers were the first uh, product to use a microprocessor, and this was the beginning days of the personal computer, Steve was the only one who saw that the future of computing was not just for experts, but it was for non-technical people who so, would be able to do amazing creative things. And so it had to be easy to use. And so seeing the same set of facts, interpreting it in a different way, is kind of what stimulates me about curiosity. So let's take a step back from Apple. And, and I, I want everybody to know that John was a truck driver. And, and I, it's my argument, my premise, that, that you driving the truck and what you did there gave rise to your unique pers per focus on, on understanding the customer, customer centricity. So tell us about those days, and I'm going to use one other phrase, 10 to 1. You were getting beat 10 to 1. So you fill in the blanks on that. Well, I uh, was an MBA graduate from the Wharton Business School. I was working in New York in um, marketing and market research. And I was recruited to Pepsi as the first MBA they'd ever hired. This is back in 1967. And they didn't know what to do with me, so they put me out on a route truck. And so I uh, said, well, I guess I gotta learn the ropes. But the interesting thing was, as I was driving trucks, and they gave me all different kinds of uh, jobs, like reloads in summertime, where I would bring a fresh truck of uh, soft drinks out to a driver salesman who was on his route. And I discovered that on a hot summer day in Pittsburgh in a large supermarket, uh, that they would sell an entire truckload of soft drinks in one store. Just think of that, one store. We could consume an entire truckload. And th that seemed to me like an amazing observation. There were many things that I learned out uh, on the road being the truck driver, but I'll tell you about this one. Because when I came back, I was put into the product development uh, organization, and I saw they were working on uh, something called a um, small plastic bottle before they had plastic soft drink bottles. And I said, can I work on that project? But what I observed uh, in the supermarkets was that uh, these big, heavy cases of returnable bottles uh, were really hard for me. I wasn't very strong, so I had to work out a, at a health club to get strong enough to lug these things around. But I said, well, why don't we make a large plastic bottle? So I got in, put in charge of working with DuPont on f first the uh, acrylonitrile, methyl acrylonitrile 
bottle, which was biodegradable, and then eventually a polyester bottle, which DuPont developed. And that was the beginning of large size packaging. And it was one of the most strategic moves later on when I became marketing vice president at Pepsi that uh, we used to take Pepsi, which at that time was outsold 10 to 1 in 50% of the US, uh, to uh, the number one selling soft drink in America uh, through you know, bottles and cans. And uh, so you discover in life that things you sort of say, how did I get this job? Actually, every opportunity you have, observe, be curious, think about it, think about a better way, think about a way to uh, interpret the facts in ways that others may not have thought of. So along the way, there was one of the most famous trials. I'm not going to say clinical trial, though that's, I guess, what we talk about it here. But that trial was caused the, was with Pepsi and Coke. The what? And that was the Pepsi challenge. Oh. And, and again, that kind of related back down to understanding the customer, that experiential aspect that, that was significant to driving share. Yeah. Well, because we were outsold by so much by Coca-Cola, we came up with this um, campaign. It was based on uh, some product testing that we have been doing, blind uh, Coke versus Pepsi. And while everyone would choose Coke, uh, particularly in these markets where they led by such a large amount, uh, because of its brand, when you showed it unidentified, uh, surprisingly, uh, Pepsi actually was slightly more preferred over Coke. So we developed a campaign called the Pepsi Challenge, um, and it became a significant uh, success. So I want to I want to get to the hard and fast aspects of of pharmaceuticals, but everybody always wants to know what the hell was it like to work with Steve Jobs. Well, I knew Steve Jobs 1.0, hmm. you know, hmm. young Steve Jobs, 26-year-old Steve Jobs. And he was absolutely as brilliant as Steve Jobs 2.0, but he was not uh, you know, a, a seasoned executive at that time. And Steve Jobs 1.0, uh, the way we worked together, we worked together seven days a week. Um, we rarely worked inside an office. We were always walking around, you know, Stanford University campus, Silicon Valley, up in Skyline, above Silicon Valley, uh, various places. Wherever we traveled, we always shared a room together. And one of the things that I really learned from Steve, uh, and you can see, because he was establishing his first principles of what Apple became when, when he returned to Apple as Steve Jobs 2.0, one of them was what Steve used to call zooming. Zoom out, connect the dots, zoom in, simplify. So connect the dots means look beyond the boundaries of the industry as it's understood by everybody else and look at the other industries that may be converging, may even touch your industry or may even you know, radically change your industry. And, and Steve did that, and I'll give you an example later in his life, because uh, it's just such, such, such a good one. Um, when, when he introduced the iPod, he didn't try to explain it, how it worked. He didn't talk about uh, you know, the next generation of miniaturized disk drives that made it, made it possible. He said, how would you like to have a 1,000 songs in your pocket? Or when he introduced the iPhone, he took the iPod and put a radio chip in it. And he, he recognized that the world was changing from 2G, which was text, to 3G wireless, which meant you could send photos. And so unlike the BlackBerry, which had a keyboard, a physical keyboard, he made the whole screen uh, something you could touch. Why? Because photos were going to be the principal purpose of it. So Steve had this uh, genius ability to not only see the world in a different way with the same set of facts that everyone else had. Remember, Kodak invented the digital camera. Kodak was doubling down on silver halide film, uh, vertical integration, at exactly the same moment that Steve introduced the iPhone. Four years later, later Kodak filed for bankruptcy, $21 billion corporation. Mm -hmm. So uh, Steve's genius was not only to see that, but also uh, his ability to be able to explain things in a s simple way. It's interesting to me that you reference a thousand songs in your pocket. 
because oftentimes in the life science industry, we ladder from feature to benefit to value. I'll, I'll use McDonald's as an example. We're loving it. Uh, you could use that kind of expression for um, the iPod. You know, all these songs will give you a unique human experience. I'm loving it. But there was a bit of granularity that really connected with the audience that I think is interesting. Yeah, well, well he was naturally charismatic. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the great benefits of his charisma was his skill at recruiting. People don't uh, always realize uh, how much talent that Steve uh, was able to bring together. And so I understand earlier uh, during this conference that um, there was a showing of the General Magic yes. mm -hmm. story, which is a f fascinating story, but uh, they always call it the most famous company that no one's ever heard of. What made General Magic so special was the talent. So the company failed. It was about 17 years ahead of the industry for uh, uh, smartphones. But Mark Peratt, who founded it, um, and I helped him um, you know, start the company and was on the board of it. Uh, he recruited just some amazing talent. He got most of the original Mac team that Steve had put together, plus others who were younger and who uh, joined afterwards. And even though General Magic failed, this talent ended up, many of them became you know, multi-billionaires and other companies that they founded af after that. So Steve's ability to recruit talent was an ex extraordinary capability, and it's, it's something that really anyone who's doing serious innovation, you know, is always all about the people. Do you think that there's a little bit of a disconnect between technological availability in, in the life science industry? So, you know, we talk about the Newton, and we talk about some things that, that were ahead of their time. Do you, do you think we're seeing innovations that are not clinically ready, that there's a bit of a, of a disconnect there that could be maybe frustrating for innovators? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but you know, I've been in healthcare and life science for about 13 years, and I decided to pick an industry that I knew virtually nothing about 13 years ago, uh, but I have a curious mind, and uh, I like to hang out with smart people, and so, I've been learning along the way, mm -hmm. and, and uh, what I've observed is that uh, there are some amazing, talented people in life science, just as there, there were in, in the world I grew up in, which was um, high technology, and that there are people who are just as big um, risk takers, who are just as passionate as we were in the high-tech world. So uh, I'm extremely impressed with the talent that life science has. Mm -hmm. The big difference is the cycle is longer. I mean, mm. it costs you know, $2.5 billion to do a successful drug discovery through success. You know, 85% of the companies fail. Um, so it's, it, it's a very high-risk um, path over a long period of time. But if you look at what's going on in immuno-oncology, I'm uh, mm -hmm. one, of the, uh, one of the founding vice pr chairman of Cellularity, which is a, a, a company you may have heard Bob Hariri earlier during this conference talk about s spinning out uh, assets around the placenta blood cord stem cell and building a company that is focused on not just CAR-T, but uh, uh, PNK, which, which is the uh, placenta blood toward stem cell and a natural killer alternative to uh, the CAR T, which is totally allogeneic. So, so let's talk a little bit about cellularity, and yeah. I want to talk well, about. Well, I'll tell you why I, I got involved with it because obviously, it, you know, I didn't bring anything in terms of um, medical science. What really intrigued me was Bob Hariri's vision that there could be a second generation that could build on the shoulders of the first generation of immuno-oncology. So the first generation, you know, clearly has shown that we can get uh, you know, something like between 50 and 85 percent efficacy with immuno-oncology, with, with uh, CAR-T, uh, generic antigen receptor technology. The, the problem is that there are a lot of side effects. Uh, this relatively small number of people have actually been treated, probably less than 3,000 if you look at all of the companies that have created such huge market value and uh, been, ac been acquired by f big pharma. 
So what Bob said was, uh, let's build a platform. I come out of the world of platforms. That's what high tech has been doing for 25 years. He said, let's build a platform using a, a really uh, available allogeneic material, uh, the placenta blood cord stem cells, and let's build a supply chain. The supply chain is what got my attention. So the su supply chain said, as we are getting INDs and doing the tests for, uh, we're doing uh, glioblastoma, acute myeloid lymphoma, uh, multiple myeloma, so we're following a path of uh, all allogeneic uh, immuno-oncology uh, therapies. At the same time, uh, Bob has built a uh, cryopreservation so we can uh, get a shelf life. He's built a $75 million factory to produce, and we're building out the whole supply chain. So the vision is not to treat just 3,000 people, uh, but why not 100,000? In other words, speed to scale. And I think speed to scale is one of the really interesting opportunities. You can see other people now working on allogeneic. Uh, um, Ari um, Belagrun, who, who founded uh, Kite, um, you know, is doing that now with Allergene. Uh, he's taking a slightly different approach than we are, but it's just an indication that we're really at the threshold of another generation, and the next generation of immuno-oncology, I believe, is going to be speed to scale. It's going to be able to completely change the economics. You may not need, you know, a half billion dollar uh, cell therapy. Uh, you may be able to drop that price by orders of magnitude. I'm reminded of Peter Diamandis' six Ds. You know, the democratization, the demonetization, the digitization, and how, how the Apple and the smartphone took that extraordinarily expensive computer that, that put us on the moon and put it in your pocket. And it seems to me a little bit like cellularity is doing it by demonetizing immuno-oncology to take it from $450,000, which, which is inaccessible, down to a, a price that, that democratizes therapy. Yeah. So let's talk about money. Let's keep on the money because I, I think that's such an important aspect of healthcare. And pharmacy benefit managers and RX Advance, I'm fascinated with what you're doing because aside from clinical innovation, aside from CAR-T and immuno-oncology, it's just the simple idea of waste, how waste is extraordinarily powerful in driving costs. So give us an update on what's going on well, with RX well, Advance. Well, I'm part of the founding team of, of a company called uh, RX Advance. It's a platform automation company that's really focused on the incredible inefficiencies in the healthcare system. So if you just take um, prescription drugs, uh, it's about $470 billion just for the, rev the revenue of the prescription drugs, but it's about $840 billion out of that $3.6 trillion. Uh, when you look at all of the related derivative uh, activities of expense, and, and so McKinsey Global Institute estimates that about $900 billion of fraud, waste, abuse, uh, misuse, avoidable costs. Uh, and Platform technology is, is going to be uh, a, a really big game changer. Why? Because it's changed every other industry, and the healthcare industry is coming at it 20 years later. Uh, so it's well proven technology. Uh, but what isn't proven yet is uh, learning how to deal with the incredible complexities, both at federal and state levels, uh, for the healthcare system, yeah. plus special interests. You know, uh, no industry has more. Uh, money spent on lobbyists than uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare in industry. So our platform automation, uh, we started the company five years ago. We did a, uh, $10 billion of contracted revenue last year. We hope to double that this year. So these seem like big numbers, but in the context of healthcare, you know, they just... You know, you're just getting above the asterisk. So it's so interesting in the, in the esoteric aspects of immuno-oncology and, and waste in prescription drugs. Yeah. The answer is the same. It's that platform-based technology yeah. well, that goes well, back to tech. It's required by CMS that, that every script be documented for clinical claims and related lab data. Uh, PBMs have been the adjudicating engine between uh, big pharma, the health plans, the, ph the pharmacies. Uh, the purpose of it for the f big pharma is to get on the formularies. That gives them higher probability of being selected by the physicians. 
and there's a lot of money that moves back yeah. and forth and it's all opaque. No one really gets to see it. No price transparency. Uh, no one's quite sure <coughs> you know, who's getting what. And the bottom line of it is you know, we've learned that you can take you know, incredible amounts of money, uh, probably in the context of the <coughs> that whole industry as I described it, you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. Not tens of billions, hundreds of billions hundreds of dollars of, billions. of uh, cost out. Uh, in fact, enough money could be taken out of uh, that to probably uh, give everybody health insurance in the United States. Fascinating. And you know, some some level of quality. Yesterday we had an interesting talk by Dina Katabi at MIT about sensors, about about the evolving role of sensors. I, I'm sure many of you recall it's sort of the sensorless sensor, if you will, and. Um, Zsen is an interesting company that you're working on, and, and the evolution of the sensor and the empowerment of detection seems to be a game changer from yeah. my perspective. So, um, I'm, I'm involved with life science. <coughs> I'm involved with um, uh, platform technologies in the healthcare system, but I'm also involved with uh, medical device innovation too. And uh, we have a company in London. Uh, which is called ZSEN, uh, which is primary mission is to do a non-invasive blood glucose monitor, uh, which actually is extremely accurate and is uh, consistently accurate. And it's an entirely different path than what people have been doing with spectroscopy. Spectroscopy, if you're familiar with it, is optics, and it's basically based on a sine wave, and sine waves uh, cannot be measured accurately because they're oscillating at uh, multiple frequencies. So this is a digital signal uh, technology that's able to look through the epidermis, uh, look at the blood glucose monitoring, doesn't have to um, go to an alternative like uh, the proxy of mm -hmm. interstitial fluids, but actually looks at the uh, blood glucose you know, in, in, in the finger. and. In the process of developing that, and we're uh, productizing that so it could go into digital watches, it can go into smartphones and other devices, and um, so that's making you know, excellent uh, progress. In the process of our investigative research, here's what was really interesting. We <coughs> discovered, working with a London Hospital, that our technology can look through in layers, and we can look at a woman's breast, and we can go all the way down and detect a cancerous uh, tumor in the breast long before it's ever could be discovered with mammography. Now, if you get it early enough, people wouldn't have to die. And we've also discovered that we can look through the epidermis and detect uh, melanoma without a biopsy. Uh, this, these are sensors. So we talked a little bit about the traditional staging of cancer and the emergence of stage zero medicine. Now, now is the technology um, non-invasive? Is it a, a device you put on top of the skin? Uh, I don't want you to give any trade secrets away. Yeah. But no, it, it, it's, it's not an issue. Um, th think of it this way, that, that if you have a non-invasive digital signal technology uh, that is absolutely accurate, you know, it's, it's, it's as accurate as if you took a real blood test, and not only can you look at um, the uh, blood glucose monitoring, but uh, we discovered that there's a digital signature for other blood constituents. So we look at electrolytes, we can look at potassium, we can look at sodium, we can look at hemoglobin, we can look at HDL, LDL, A1C. In other words, you can start to build a profile um, all non-invasively. So this is just an example of where sensors are going. When I came to Silicon Valley, it was the beginning of commercialization of Moore's Law. That's the, the uh, exponential math of, you know, compounding math that um, about every 18 to 24 months, you can double the number of transistors on a given area of a wafer. And w we're all the uh, beneficiaries of all the amazing products we have today. Well, now we're at the beginning of the era of sensors. So going back to Peter Diamandis, um, uh, who was found, uh, one of the co-founders of S Singularity University, uh, he, he calculated uh, an estimate that there will be 500 billion, 500 billion wireless connected devices in the world 
by 2030. Uh, and there are only 7.2 people on the planet. So what's connecting? What's connecting are sensors, sensors to sensors, sensors to computers, sensors to people. Uh, so we are in the early stages of the era of sensors. The whole uh, planet is going to be covered with sensors at some, some point. But now go back into healthcare, go back into to, uh, life science. You know, if you can go in and, and take an example that I just gave of looking at people at, at um, point zero when they are just getting a cancer and you have a higher probability of um, you know, giving a cure, compare that with the life science path uh, where we still only have 3,000 people who have ever been treated with uh, immuno-oncology uh, with efficacy of you know, 50 to 85 percent. So there are many different ways in which technology can have impact on cancer in addition to the kind of breakthroughs we're seeing with uh, immuno-oncology. Is, it, is ZSEN going down the, the blood glucose monitoring path to measure blood chemistries, or have they kind of stumbled into early detection in oncology? What's the future for that? Well, we, we are f uh, focused on blood glucose monitoring because uh, if you take companies like Dexcom and, and Abbott, uh, they make a patch uh, center which, which is minimally invasive, and then you can interrogate it with a smartphone, and it's connected to uh, an insulin pump. And so for a type 1 diabetic, that's you know, a great solution. Uh, we're focused on type 2 diabetics. There's an estimate about 600 million uh, people who either have diabetes or who are you know, at high risk of diabetes around, around the world. That's uh, largely type 2 diabetes. And there, they're not trying to get uh, insulin. They're trying to you know, avoid the concentration of blood uh, glucose. So uh, we are a startup, so we're very focused on that. Uh, we're also in the process of, uh, we will probably sell the company mm -hmm. sometime next year. And the reason we're selling it is that we have so much technology. There's so many things that uh, we're not set up to be able to productize, like the things I talked about in oncology, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that will, there are people who are interested in John, Those do you think that the sluggish approval process of traditional pharma yeah. is almost antithetical to the rapid discovery of technology? And ultimately, by the time something gets through a, a clinical trial, we may see a disruption of the disruptor. Yeah. For example, with, with a, a diabetic sensors now for continuous blood glucose monitoring, you guys seem to be poised to disrupt what is generally regarded as today's innovation. Yeah, well, well the path to you get FDA approval, uh, and uh, well, first you get FDA clearance, and then you get FDA approval. Uh, so the, it's a much faster path for us for medical devices than it would be for um, doing a cell therapy, you know, IND through the whole test sequence for FDA. But uh, I think th things really changed a lot when Scott Gottlieb was mm -hmm. uh, head of uh, FDA, and I believe that's going to continue. So. Uh, we're encouraged that there's going to be, you know, more and more opportunities for new breakthrough uh, uh, and therapies in life, life science. And we had Bakul Patel from the FDA, I don't know if he's here now, but, but leading the digital health initiative. So I think there's a regulatory perspective that is mainstreaming some of these. Yeah. Well, uh, the ch ch mm -hmm. challenge is, I, I think, in the, in the regulatory side is that the regulators have to deal with both innovation and you know, you know, looking at the safety concerns of the products that are being approved. And uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in, in, in that. I th think a, a lot of us would like to see you know, the higher priority on, on, on the innovation, but you know, that's we, we had a fascinating that's discussion up. last night about what is the mission of the FDA? Yeah. Is the mission of the FDA to foster innovation or is the mission of the FDA to protect the public. And, and I don't want to get into that, but I think it's an interesting challenge. Generics on demand. What the heck is that? Well, as, as we all know... Uh, and I know you can't name the company. It's, no. it's secret, so I no. beg me the indulgence. No, uh, as we all know, that 90% that, uh, of the prescription drugs are generics, that the, there is really no assurance on the quality of, of, of the uh, materials. You know, most come from China, some from uh, India. And 
there are, um, I'll just say, uh, reasons to believe that uh, it's going to be very practical to <coughs> be able to uh, manufacture generic uh, prescription drugs on demand. And you can imagine you know, the many types of applications for that, you know, with the military, uh, with uh, you know, trying to deal with catastrophes where you've got to get you know, immediate uh, source of prescription drugs you know, to people. Or eventually, you could even imagine that uh, you know, pharmacies will be able to manufacture generic drugs right on premise. Can I manufacture them in my house? No. Can I have a no. 3D no. printer? It, That's a little bit... It, it's still going to be highly regulated. Yeah. So we live in the world that is dominated by the likes of Google and Apple and consumer centricity. Let, let's talk a little bit about that whole evolving dynamic, the, the empowered patient. And maybe there are some lessons that we can learn from you about that well, I th It would be amazing to me if the healthcare industry doesn't achieve the same transformations that every other industry uh, in the US has, which is to invert the pyramid where in the past it was always the institutions ha at the top and the uh, bottom was the customer in every other industry from e-commerce to, to uh, entertainment, to financial services, to telecommunication, every one of those industries have inverted it and the customer is at the center of everything. Uh, and Apple and Google are good examples of that. So why hasn't it happened in healthcare? Well, it will happen in healthcare. It's just uh, hasn't happened yet. And the platform automation will be a part of that. Uh, sensors will be a part of that. Uh, many of the uh, things that you see going on at uh, retail, uh, Walmart is building out uh, you know, tests of health hubs in Georgia. Uh, uh, CVS has 1,500 minute clinics that they've been building out in a new model. Walgreens is, has some as well. Uh, Best Buy has said they're going to double the size of their $30 billion business by opening up uh, health hubs and something equivalent to their geek squads, which will be care uh, givers who can you know, make it to the home. So uh, telehealth, but all of these things are going to help invert the uh, yet, yet, pyramid where mm -hmm. the, the customer, as opposed to the institutions, will eventually be the center. Yet, yet telemedicine has been a little sluggish from my perspective, the uptake. Telemedicine has been a little bit sluggish. I well, always ask the audience yeah, how many people well, well, have taken uh, telemedicine. My opinion, the reason why telemedicine has been slow to take off is, is that, first of all, uh, the uh, uh, payers didn't really want it. They thought it added cost and uh, didn't change anything from their standpoint. The world has rapidly changed now that, that just about every state uh, allows some form of reimbursement mm -hmm. for telehealth. Uh, telehealth started out with low acuity care. It's now starting to move into what's called virtual primary care, uh, which means that uh, you're getting a... Uh, uh, primary care physician uh, who could also be a nurse practitioner uh, who was able to uh, have a video conference you know with a patient and um, people can expect to have you know more uh, types of services for example if you uh, go to virtual primary care which is really looking at um, you know holistically giving someone the alternative to have a primary care physician virtually uh, this means they could have their annual physical largely virtually. So you can get your lab core tests for mm -hmm. blood and, and, and urine. You can get, you know, other things that are done, you know, by you know, walking into a Walmart or Walgreens or CVS. And so you have some in person, some uh, virtual. And it means that the, the utilization of uh, telehealth, which has been very low, you know, people use it maybe once a year. Um, because they have the flu and they want to get a prescription quickly. Well, now if you start to go to virtual primary care, you can start to see a relationship building up. And it's, I think if you want to look at uh, an indicator, look at where online banking was back in 1995. People said, will it really happen? Will the money be safe? You know, will I, can I trust it? Well, you know, nobody writes checks anymore. Um, Cash is disappearing, but everything is, is uh, going to different types of payment systems. So I, I think it's inevitable that uh, virtual primary care, uh, which is really the next era of telehealth, 
is going to be huge. I mean, it's, it's look at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, no, no one's done a better job than Bernard Tyson in making that so fundamental that, that they have more virtual uh, sessions now than they do face-to-face -face sessions with patients. I want to wrap it up. We have a lot of innovators in the audience today. Some of them are innovators in a big structure, a recalcitrant pharma kind of industry. Some are the lone innovators. What are some of your words of wisdom about on the path of, of innovation, some of those things that kind of drive us forward? It all goes back to what, what um, you asked me about in the beginning of this conversation, uh, curiosity. Um, whether you're you know, a lone uh, scientist working on a bench top or whether you are an entrepreneur starting a company because you have a dream and a passion for it. Uh, it all starts with curiosity. Of there has to be a better way. Um, the most successful entrepreneurs are able to articulate what it is they're trying to do, so mm. they attract talented people to want to join them. Uh, the barriers to entry are uh, lower than ever before, but that means that things commoditize faster than ever before. So you've got to have you know, a at least a strategy of how you're going to do speed to scale. If you don't speed to scale, you can have the best idea, but you know somebody else will come after you and speed to scale. So that's that, that's always the risk. So you have to be a risk taker. Some people take risk and love it. I'm a risk taker. I don't mind failing. You know, I just try to learn from what I failed at so that I don't make the same mistake the next next time. And I think that uh, entrepreneurial uh, economy is the is an amazing strength of the United States. You know, our form of capitalism is is, is largely driven, uh, is fueled by ent entrepreneurs. Uh, I, I hope we don't lose that. So curiosity meets risk. John, thank you very much for sharing some time thank with you. us today. Thank you all.